We've come to make you new. This child that you delivered will soon deliver you. Mary, did you know that your baby boy would give sight to a blind man? Did you know that your baby boy will calm the storm with his hand? Did you know that your baby boy has walked with just trod? When you kissed your little baby, This afternoon, this is Emmy. My name's Henrik, and uh, we want to welcome you to Sonoma Valley Community Church to our afternoon Christmas Eve service. We're so glad that you're here to join us. And there's a verse in Scripture, Micah 7:7, 7, 7, that says, "But as for me, I watch in hope for the Lord. I wait for God, my Savior. My God will hear me." And that's the human side of wanting to hear God answer our prayers, of wanting to believe that God is with us, that he cares, that there is solicitude between us as God and person. And then there is a verse of scripture that reflects God's side of that equation. And he has this to say in 2 Kings 25, I have heard your prayer and seen your tears. I will heal you. I have heard your prayer and seen your tears. I will heal you. Would you join me in a word of prayer? Lord God, we thank you this afternoon for this momentous time of reflecting on the birth of Jesus Christ, the life, the ministry, the passion, the death, and the resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ, and then, yes, even the return of Christ. 
Lord God, this evening, we want to enter into your story and find our own true selves. We pray, Lord God, that you would do a miracle work to touch deeper down below the surface, surface of who we really are as men, as women, as boys and girls, as young teens. Oh, Lord God, may we hear your voice this, this afternoon, your Holy Spirit, the still, small voice of God speaking to our hearts. And may you help us to exercise faith that leads to obedience and to joy. We pray, Lord God, for those who are not able to come, who are sick or otherwise engaged. Lord, we pray for you to bless the people of this church. And we also ask, Lord God, that you would do a wonderful work in the city of Sonoma. We pray, Lord God, for all those who don't have a church home, don't have a place where they can sort themselves out in their relationship with God. I pray, Lord God, that this might be a home and that you would bless us as a church to be able to share the blessing of God with people, the love of God with people, the grace and the truth of God. Thank you for the baby's sound this evening that reminds us that you were not ashamed or afraid to take the form of a baby and to live a human life for a period of time. Lord God, we pray for your blessing. Lord, help us to rest in your goodness. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, I want to say that it is wonderful to celebrate Jesus Christ and his birth and his life on Christmas Eve. So thankful for you coming this evening to join with us in doing that. I want to let you know that you're among friends, that you're welcome here. We're so grateful that each and every one of you has taken the moment of time, a little bit of time this afternoon, to join with us in celebrating God's life among us. We have candles that are lit. On the one side is the Advent wreath, and all the candles are lit, and on the other side, just a collection of candles. And I don't know how you feel about them, but I love candles because they just uh, remind me of the light of God. They, they are a, a contingent event that takes place because there's always something burning and always something that is doing the burning, and it's a dynamic kind of experience. I just love seeing the, the twinkle of the light there, and I think Christmas has a lot to do with the light of God twinkling in the darkness, and the darkness is not able to overcome it. Well, I want to uh, invite someone special to come forward. <coughs> Excuse me. And that's Lucilia Wolf. I'd like to invite her to come and play the harp. <coughs> and I'd like to invite you, as if we were in a concert hall, to just give her a hand of welcome. <laughs> Lucilia, thank you for... Uh, lifting up God through these this medley of uh, of tunes. Let me make sure that your mic is on, because I don't want you to miss out. And I don't want anybody to miss out there. Now it's on. So let's invite the Holy Spirit to speak to us as she plays this wonderful instrument.
wow, this is the best place to be in Sonoma right now. <laughs> Thank you so much. You did such a wonderful job. I want to invite us to uh, prepare our hearts to sing one Christmas carol right now. Hark the herald angels sing. Would you please stand if you're able? And uh, we will all sing this. And I want you to come. Yeah. You need a mic? Yeah, yeah I'll take it. Okay. Perfect timing. Okay. Let's sing together. Mark the herald angels sing Glory to the newborn King Peace on earth and mercy mild God and sinners reconciled Joyful all ye nations rise Joy the triumph of the skies with angelic hosts proclaim Christ is born in Bethlehem Hark the herald angels sing Glory to the newborn King Christ by heaven's heaven adored Christ the Except for Monk Hagee, who I'd lo love to invite to come up and uh, find the passage of scripture here at the lectern. Thank you for coming, Monk. Monk is a walking miracle. It was just in the last week that he had heart surgery. And uh, he is here because we love him. And he's here because uh, of God's grace in his life. Go ahead, Monk. I'll be reading Luke 2, 1 through 20. And I apologize for my voice. I have a little bit of laryngitis tonight. Bear with me. <clears throat> In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. <clears throat> this was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth to Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David. Because he belonged to the house and the line of David, he went there to register with Mary who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. <clears throat> While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. 
She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. Excuse me. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over the flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone around them. Do not be afraid, I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. (coughs) This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heaven host, heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God, the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those whom his favor rests. When the angel had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard hear it were amazed to what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. Merry Christmas, everybody. Merry Christmas. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Yeah, I just want to be courteous. I'd like to invite us to stand again and sing the song that comes from this passage, O Little Town of Bethlehem, How Still We See Thee Lie. Would you join us, please? See 
to us, abide with us, our Lord Shake the hand of someone near you and go ahead and sit down and make sure you're happy. If you have a pew, ba pew Bible in front of you in the rack before you or you brought one, I want to invite you to grab that Bible. We're going to talk for a little bit about the astounding Christmas prologue, The Good Confession. I want to talk about a good confession from John chapter 1, verses 14 to 18. Here's what it says. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, Full of grace and truth, John testified concerning him. He cried out, saying, This is the one I spoke about when, he, when I said, He who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. Out of his fullness we have all received grace in place of grace already given. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son, who is Himself God and is in closest relationship with the Father, has made Him known. The Word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, when we come to this time of holiday cheer, when we come to this time of Christmas celebration, sometimes that that joyous note can fall flat because of the circumstances that are taking place in our lives. We feel a sense of, of, of pain that is running through our minds that seems to be discordant with the joy of the season. There is a young woman, Sydney Moore, who on December 10th experienced that kind of pain. She recounted how a destructive tornado in Tennessee occurring on Saturday, December 9th, tore through her mobile home and lifted a bassinet containing her child. The four-month-old child still inside the bassinet 
managed to survive the calamity and was found amidst a fallen tree during a heavy downpour of rain. Recalling the harrowing experience, 22-year-old Sidney Moore, the mother of already two children at that age, detailed the roof being torn off the mobile home as the tornado approached. The tip of the tornado came down, she said, and picked up the bassinet with my baby Lord in it. He was the first thing to go up, Sidney recalled. Her boyfriend and the child's father, Aramis Youngblood, tried his best to shield Lord in the bassinet. But he too was lifted up by the tornado's force, and he suffered a broken shoulder and a broken arm. Later, in the midst of the pouring rain, Sidney and Aramis finally found their baby boy alive, nestled in what the mother described as a little tree cradle. Here's a picture of that sweet little boy whose name is Lord. Expressing her initial fears, Sidney stated, I thought Lord was dead. I was pretty sure he was dead. And we weren't going to find him. But by the grace of God, the couple's story took a happy turn. As Sidney observed the aftermath of the tornado, she described the surreal experience of seeing her boyfriend bringing Lord back to her through the devastation in the pouring rain. Recalling that surreal moment when she started to realize that her baby boy was yet alive, she expressed, I saw him walking through the woods, carrying Lord in the pouring rain. All of his clothes were ripped. It was like the scene of a movie. Here's a picture of Lord with his older brother named Princeton. What a set of names, huh? Princeton and Lord. This, this mother has great anticipation for her, her sons to do great things in this world. Well, our lives can often take a turn on a dime. Life or death, grace or tragedy. And often we confess what we truly believe in those moments of exigency. Exigency, exigency yeah. It is a, usually a word of despair. Exigency is a word that means times when a crisis makes demands. Are there any people here this evening who have experienced a crisis making a demand upon your life in this past year of 2023? Ah, I guess everybody has done just great, but I've experienced some demands, some crisis. We are living in historical times that do make demands of us. Some people feel those demands more than others. And they need a way to express themselves, their feelings, their psyche, their, the issues, and their deepest beliefs about how to, to understand these difficult moments that they may be facing. A second word that comes to mind about this story is resilience. Little Lord had resilience even in the face of a tornado. And so did the mom. And so did the dad. I mean, after having his shoulder broken and his arm broken, he still went out looking for little Lord. Resilience is a word that means the ability to bounce back from misfortune or trouble when it comes calling in your life. Resilience can be tested by the enormity of the crisis, asking a person to not dwell on what has been perhaps lost, but to find hope in a future that is yet to be set right and established. Someone once said, and you probably have heard a version of this, that we can live without food for weeks. We can live without water for days, and we can live without air for perhaps six minutes, give or take but we really can't live without hope. Hope dares to give when no one is sharing. Hope gives. I love it. 
I love that. Hope gives. Even when no one believes, hope gives. Even when the circumstances seem too far gone, hope gives. Even when you have hit the bottom with no plan of getting out, hope gives. What does hope give? Hope gives motivation and courage needed to succeed through some of life's toughest times. Hope is a powerful thing. It is the fuel to keep moving forward when times get tough. It brings enthusiasm for the future, and sometimes it even supplies enough reason to live. More often than not, a lack of hope and a lack of energy go hand in hand. How many have experienced lack of energy in their lives? When you have lack of energy, sometimes the reason seems to be that your connection to the hope that is giving you motivation may be weaker than at other times. And so it is very difficult to walk through, through challenging times and cope with life's challenges without hope. But the person who is full of hope is motivated to welcome life and all the challenges it brings. The last four verses of John's prologue are a confession of one simple thought, that the Word became flesh. But there are many nuances to this confession. The confession that the Word became flesh is a confession that not only Jesus is God becoming flesh, but also that we, when we are connecting to God through the Spirit, that we become the Word for other people. That our flesh becomes a vehicle for instilling hope in those around us. The best leadership theory, the best leadership examples are of people who actually instill good hope, healthy hope in people's lives. Not hugely optimistic people who are emphasizing the power of positive thinking, but those who ground hope in real dynamics that lift people. You know, the, the principle of aerodynamics is that, is that million-pound airplanes can lift up off the ground if the angle of their wings is appropriate, if the shape of their wings is appropriate, and if they're moving fast enough. And you wouldn't have thought that human beings would be able to fly, but somebody hoped in it. And here in America, it was the Wright brothers who, who worked on a certain gearing mechanism that had shifting ability in three points that allowed them to start the process of lifting human beings' weight off the ground. And so they had hope, but they planned, and they, and they imagined, and they executed on those plans. Despair is a spiritual sickness and a disease that afflicts all who don't know the Word become flesh in their own lives. It may manifest in a lot of different ways, including really happy, happy talk. It may, it may involve whistling past the graveyard. It may involve tears, and it may involve all sorts of emotions that that could be cataloged. But Jesus has made God known to everyone and replaced the grace of the law with the grace of forgiveness and spiritual intimacy with God through Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. One of the great lessons of Scripture is that we can't truly be joyful, that we can be truly joyful if we live by faith with our living God. The only antidote to the sickness of despair and fear and trembling before our own mortality and the tragedies of life is the intrusion of a loving and living God into our lives. God is saving us who have hope in Him in the midst of success or catastrophe for a higher purpose, a higher spiritual purpose and as a witness of living hope. I love this slide. It reflects verse 14, but it also reflects a little baby's foot. 
And if you look close enough, even though it is not an easily visible foot, you see the creases, you see the little toes. And it reminds me of my children who were here in that pew this morning. And when they were just little babies in the, in, in the, opera, in the, in the delivery room, I guess. And, uh, you know, all of a sudden, there is my daughter in my hands. There is my son in my hands. And it is such a miracle to experience that, to have the privilege of experiencing that. And so when the Bible says the word became flesh, it's not talking from a philosophic standpoint. It's talking from a very realistic standpoint that each of us has become the word made flesh. Mom and dad, somewhere along the line, in love, made the word become flesh. And God is saying that that's what happened with Jesus. That, that he, out of love for human beings all over the world, and there have been 117 billion people on planet Earth, according to the mathematicians, at any one time. And believe it or not, 7% of those 117 billion people are alive right now. 8 billion of us. And God is saying, I love every one of you who have the uniqueness of that foot and your own unique footprint, your own unique identity, your own unique feelings, emotions, aspirations. I have hope for you. I want you to live into eternity and to experience the love I have for you. It's a great message. It's a message that resonates because it is the love of God and the power of God that provide us the hope we need to get through difficult times. Gaining confidence in the word becoming flesh when we, when we take in the entirety of the birth, life, ministry, passion, death, and resurrection of Jesus it becomes real. The more you get closer to that story, the more the story gets closer to you. And all of a sudden you hear God whispering a rhema word, a Holy Spirit word into your soul. And all of a sudden it's like, wow, what happened? Just a few weeks ago, 300 Muslim men in Palestine had spontaneous conversions to Jesus Christ because they were sleeping at night and Jesus Christ came to them in their dreams. Now, if you don't believe me, it's okay. Go look on the internet about 300 men converting to Christ spontaneously in Palestine. We gain confidence in God because the closer we get to Him, the closer we experience the goodness, the grace, and the truth of who He is. In 1 John 1, 8 and 9, we see the mechanism that God uses in our lives because we realize that we don't measure up to all that God might uh, portray himself to be in terms of being holy and right and honest and all of this. And so there's a lot of people who don't go uh, pursuing God because they feel that they don't have the right to be in a relationship with God. But God says not, that's not true. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Those are self-deceived people. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. There's not a single thing that we can do that will offend God to the point that He wants to reject us unless we reject Him all our lives. And so we see this dynamic working out that God is saying, I'm, I love you this much. As far as the east is from the west, I want to embrace you. I want you to know my love. Now, confession takes on two different major nuances in the, in the Bible. One is a prayer of confession, and there's many varieties of that. But it's essentially people coming before God and saying, look, I'm not right in some way, and I want to tell you about it. And God is saying, yes, come to me. Come to me and tell me what's going on in your life. 
Take time to pray. Take time to sit out in nature and to listen to what the sound is that's going on around you. And then talk to me. Let me hear your voice. Let me hear your thoughts. And so people in all sorts of ways have confessed. People who are, who are drowning in the ocean say, God, help me, save me. If you, if you help me and save me right now, I'll, I'll serve you the rest of my life. That's a, that's a mini prayer of confession. And there are all sorts of versions of this. People find themselves in difficult spots. And God says, I welcome your prayer of confession. And then there's a different kind of confession that is also a good confession, and that's the confession of confessing Christ, of speaking about what He's doing in your life, of letting people know that the, you are living with the goodness of God even in the midst of difficult times. One of the most profound verses of Scripture for me is found in the book of Job, one of the oldest books in the Bible, chapter 1, verse 21, and it reads along these lines. The Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And in all these things, Job never sinned. Now it's amazing that he had so much tragedy happen at that point in the journey, he was able to say, God, I just surrender and I'm going to wait patiently for you to bring the outcome of these circumstances. It is hard for me to be patient at times. It is hard for me to wait on the Lord, but God calls me nonetheless to confess Christ, to confess that He has the answers that He has the unique vision and perspective on my life that I need to be able to not move or fall into despair, but rather to stay in and walk in a living hope in Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. You see, confessing Christ is part of the mechanism as well of God instilling a living hope in our hearts and in our lives. Jesus is the only one, according to Scripture, who explained Creator God. And He spent time among people, who many of which did not receive Him. They ultimately slaughtered Him. John the Baptist and Jesus, who offered grace and truth rather than the order of dictatorship based on political power, violence, lies, and oppression. My friends, in these days, we still have this false opportunity to rest our lives in dictatorship rather than in the grace and the truth of Jesus Christ. Some people try to use the Jesus and the Bible to justify doing evil, but Jesus himself says no. He says, I love you and I forgive you and I want you to walk with me and I want to stay with you. My friends, our church is not looking for you to give money to our church. Our church is not looking to coerce you into a relationship with God. We are praying that, that the Holy Spirit will inspire you because of the circumstances of your life to seek after God, to confess a good confession, a confession that says, God, I am not the center of the universe. I need your help. I need you to help me find humility, grace, and truth in my life. The past year has been filled with a lot of darkness, if we be honest. But our church gave more than ever to the needs of the world. And part of the reasoning behind our little church Ministering and giving away resources has been this verse in Psalm 27. I would have lost heart unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage and He shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. And so we are all called, all called if we're God's children to wait on the Lord.
And as we wait on the Lord, God starts to meet us in our silent nights. We reached a milestone of hosting blood drives this year as we received over 300 units of blood, human blood, for local hospitals in our county to save lives. We have this evening on our property, doing the sound in the back, Ken, who is a nurse at Sonoma, Sonoma Hospital, and he has used some of this blood to actually save some people's lives here in Sonoma. What a privilege it is for our church to host blood drives. We also reached a milestone of gathering and assembling and shipping 395 shoeboxes for love of love for international children who are poor and needy in our world. All year round, some of our ladies are working to assemble these boxes. And we blew the previous year's numbers out of the water. 395 boxes were sitting here in the shape of a Christmas tree, so high that I couldn't even get to the top of it. And we then had them pass along. Each box represented $10 of shipping costs. I mean, it's real. But we know that those boxes have gone to children who are poor and needy, and I'm so proud of the people who've been involved with that and who have made that happen. It's a box of not only love, but hope. And then we put on a second annual production, a live nativity that was beautiful, profound, and fun for all who came just a couple weeks ago and saw the production with live camels. We had a baby camel three weeks old. I mean, I'd never been that close to a baby camel. And petting zoo animals and multi-ethnic actors. We, we don't have the Hispanic church with us tonight because she's, she must have given birth. So, I mean, there's blessing all around. And we've done all this while we have continued to suffer through a veritable plague of personal illness, age-related weakness, surgeries, and loss of energy. The story of God's work is not fully told of the ongoing miracle of our little church in the midst of Sonoma, a multi-billion dollar set of lifestyle brands. All the challenges of keeping a little church going after a pandemic are on the shoulders of Jesus Christ among us. He is the source and supply of all we need and the answers to genuine and authentic prayer that we need so as to give His great name the glory that He deserves so we can thrive together in all eternity. I want to call us to a good confession in the Gospel of John. Despair and fear are not God's will for my life or yours. God, Jesus came that we might have life and have it abundantly. In 1 Peter 1.3, we read this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of His great mercy, He has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. We experience living hope when Jesus Christ is transforming our lives by adding a connection between our spirits and the Spirit of God. When the Spirit of God and our spirits are talking to each other, when they're connecting, all of a sudden our psychology changes. We may still be just as much suffering as we were before, but now we have new meaning in the midst of our suffering because we realize Jesus is suffering with us. He's joined with us. And He's giving us new strength and new courage to be a better self rather than be a very difficult, difficult person who is bitter and who is angry. God doesn't want to turn us into bitter, angry people. He wants us to rejoice in His goodness in the land of the living. And so I want to invite us to consider that hope means an eager, confident expectation of God's goodness in the land of the living. I want to extend to you a message that God has living hope for you and that 
The living hope leads us into his love. And when his love is connecting in our hearts, then we start doing things that are loving and kind and tenderhearted and forgiving. Those 395 boxes, we're not trying to be proud, prideful about it. They're evidence that God is working among us, not just so that more people can come, but they're evidence that His salvation work is really happening in our lives. Nobody gets involved in putting 395 boxes together for children they'll never meet. That's crazy, except for the love of God. I am so proud of the idea that if you want a job done, ask an 80-year-old person. Because you know what? 80-year-old people get the job done. They have a lot of life's wisdom. Moses was some 80, 90-year-old when he led Israel through the, into the promised land. And so we're a church of a lot of older people, but we're starting to have a lot of breath. We're starting to have a lot of impact. And I want to invite you to join us this coming year to be part of God's new body, God's new activity here at Sonoma Valley Community Church. Let's sing the life of this reality by singing Silent Night together. I'd like to invite you to grab your candle, turn it on. It's electronic, so it won't hurt you. It's just a little battery in there. And I want to invite you to lift your candle high, and we're going to sing Silent Night together. I don't even know how to make this work. Here we go. so much fun to sing that song at least once a year all go up a little too yeah excellent excellent thank you pat so the body of christ is made up of people who are located in different corners of the world different communities and one of our faithful members and an elder in our church is Susie perry she's here this evening and this slide was taken at her home some years back and every year she wants to remind everyone
to go pick up a one-year Bible so that they can start at the beginning of the year on January 1, reading through the Bible and, and being on a pace so that by the end of the year, you've made it all the way through the Bible. And the benefit of doing that is that you will read scriptures that you will not hear discussed at church. You will have God speaking to you through verses of scripture by means of his Holy Spirit, raising up a surplus of meaning that, that touches your life. And so we want to invite you to expose your mind and your heart and your thinking and your worldview to the Bible as a source of wisdom. We also want to have a gift given to everybody who's here. If you can hold on just a second, my wife will make sure that the dear lady who's going out the door gets her gift. Uh, we have a Christmas ornament for every household, for every person. And the, household, the ornament is a little... Here, I'll grab it. This must be some that weren't fully done. She's got the real basket. And they have one of five different keys on it. And these keys um, have below them, ask, seek, and knock. And then you open the door and uh, it says whatever it says in there. <laughs> okay? My wife didn't finish these because she did as many as she could. But each of you is going to get one of these if you're willing to take one. My wife will be passing them out. And she'll start bringing them down the road, and I'd like down the row, and I'd like to pray for God's blessing and favor on your life this evening. Lord God, our Christmas prayer this evening is that God will bless each person who's here as we celebrate the birth of Christ, and that they might all that we might all have peace in the depths of our hearts, that we might experience hope for each tomorrow day that we're able to live and that joy would fill every season of our lives even those that are challenging lord god we pray that your favor would be upon people not because of what we have done but because of what you have done and that because we be so overwhelmed by your favor and your blessing that we would open our hearts and our minds and our hands and say yes god I want to receive you into my life as my Lord and Savior. I pray, Lord God, that you would bless the people who are here this evening, those who may be watching online. Where there is conflict, may there be peace. Where there is discouragement, may, be, may there be new hope. Where there is coldness of heart, may your love enter in. Lord, I pray that every man and woman might become more forgiving, more kind, more tender-hearted toward others in their family, in their marriage, their children, their neighbors, their places of work. Oh, Lord God, as we draw close to You, may we become people who are attractive to those in our world whose souls are troubled by conflict and and crisis and difficulty. Oh Lord God, give to us a stability and, and a maturity in our souls. Lord, help us to look at people with the eyes of faith and with the eyes of kindness rather than with eyes of judgmentalism. Lord God, I pray that you would work in the lives of our people. I thank you for the honor to serve as a pastor here. And I pray, Lord God, that you would enrich our marriages, that you would enrich our parenting, that you would enrich our grandparenting. Lord God, I pray for your blessing on the city leaders of Sonoma. I thank you for those who've received new jobs this year. I thank you, Lord God, for those who've overcome health crisis. I thank you, Lord God, for those who have, who've moved through spiritual crisis. And I pray, Lord God, that you would by your Holy Spirit and your presence, make yourself very real to us in 2024, the year of the open door. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well,
you'll be getting one of those gifts. I hope my wife keeps moving those, those uh, little ornaments along. And I want to uh, invite us to sing a couple of songs, three songs that are not necessarily Christian songs. Our service is over, but they're songs that make hearts and spirits rise. And one of those songs would have been from Nuevo Pacto, the Hispanic church that rents from us, but uh, the wife of the pastor must have just given birth. And so that's why that church is not here to help us sing um, Feliz Navidad. So in lieu of singing Feliz Navidad, we'll just move right on to the next song, which is We Wish You a Merry Christmas. Would you stand as we sing this song? We wish you a Merry Christmas. We wish you a Merry Christmas. We wish you a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Glad tidings we bring to you and your kin. We wish you a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Oh, bring us some figgy pudding. Oh, bring us some figgy pudding. Oh, bring us some fitty pudding and bring it right here. Glad tidings we bring to you and your kin. We wish you a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. We won't go until we get some. We won't go until we get some. We won't go until we get some. So bring it right here. Glad tidings we bring to you and your kin. We wish you a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Now, my wife's an expert with this song, Meli Kaliki Maka. So I'm going to invite someone else to pass these along and my wife to grab the mic wherever it is. There it is. Turn that on. And I want to invite... Don, would you pass these out to this side? Because I think this side's already got them. Thank you. Really, Kaliki Maka is the thing to say on a bright Hawaiian Christmas day. Maka is the thing to say on a bright Hawaiian Christmas day. That's the island greeting that we send to you from the land where palm trees sway. Here we know that Christmas will be green and bright the sun to shine by day and the stars by night Meli Kaliki Maka is Hawaii's way to say Merry Christmas to you okay you gotta bring out your keys and we got one more song so we're going to do a little jingle bells. Dashing through the snow in a one-horse open sleigh. O'er the fields we go, laughing all the way. Ho, ho, ho. Bells on bobtails ring, making spirits bright. What fun it is to ride and sing a sleighing song tonight. Oh, jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle all the way. Oh, what fun it is to ride in a one-horse 
Let's open sleigh. Hey, jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle all the way. Oh, what fun it is to ride in a one-horse open sleigh. Amen. Amen. Want to wish you a Merry Christmas, and I hope you don't leave without your ornament and that you have a great New Year time together. If you're able, please come back on next Sunday. We'll have a wonderful service bringing in the new year. God bless you.